The following episode of The Kingdom of Isolation contains footage from the film being discussed. The footage is used solely for the purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support the animators by watching this film on Disney Plus or home media where available. This episode also contains spoilers throughout. Hello my fellow Disney fans and welcome to the latest episode of the Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of trouble why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney, and today, it's been a while since I've been able to say this, but it's time to cover a Disney film that I haven't seen yet. Until today folks, because we are covering Atlantis, The Lost Empire, released in 2001, celebrated its 20th anniversary um, last year. Now the next couple of episodes are going to be films that celebrate their 20th anniversary this year. Uh, but anyway, this being the Kingdom of Isolation, I've got to have a guest on board for this series, and my first time watching the film, and it's a first time guest as well. So, um, hey, stars aligned. What can I say? Uh, and just for the record, folks, yes, uh, I'm wearing my own little piece of uh, treasure, if you will. It's the uh, it's the Uncharted ring uh, that says Sig Parvis Magnet. It's it's the ring that Nathan Drake has in the original Uncharted trilogy. Sig Parvis Magnet. It says greatness from small beginnings. It translates to but nevertheless, uh, my guest today, uh, he's he's watched this film a lot uh, as a kid, and he refamiliarized with it. He refamiliarized himself with it um, just earlier this week. Um, he's a good friend from uh, uh, church as well. It is Jamie. Jamie, welcome along to the kingdom. Hello, uh, Fisher. Uh, thanks you for having me here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, here. Yeah. So yeah, as as I said, this is his first appearance in the Kingdom of Isolation, and. Uh, Rest assured, folks, it definitely won't be his last because I'm definitely going to try and get him on board for uh, for future episodes. Uh, now, I was going to have somebody else who is also a big fan of this film uh, to cover this uh, episode with me, but uh, because of um, because of a busy work schedule that he's got, um, I had had to try and look for um, uh, somebody else. And uh, Jamie was one of the first people to uh, ask if he was uh, able to cover this film with me so yeah so now, now you mentioned to me just before we went on camera that uh you watched this film a lot uh, as a kid what were you what were yeah. your thoughts on the film uh, as a kid compared to uh now when you watched it earlier this week well when uh uh like, i don't recall ever going to see cinema with it but we got on v vhs shows how uh -huh. now. yep yeah and first i was when i was a kid i was only like this came out in 2000, so it was about 2001. It was a bit sexish at the time. And I find that a bit scary because it's a bit of a dark film. Yeah, well, yeah, there are there are some there are some dark moments uh, in this film, and we'll definitely get into those um as we uh, progress through the um uh through the through the episode. Um but um but there's there's definitely no denying just right out of the gate, the animation in this film looks absolutely stunning. Yes, uh, I think it's because it's a new generation, like new decade, uh, not decade, uh, new millennium. I think they yeah. were. This is why I would consider their experimental animation style of film. Because yeah, because yeah, because it was during it was during the two thousands decade where you had the likes of uh, Treasure Planet, you had a uh, dinosaur as well. Um, so they look that that's that sort of era, and then and then like Brother Bear, Home on the Range. Chicken yeah. Little, Meet the Robinsons. Let's see the, the see, film. The films that came out in the uh, in the two thousands decade, folks. Th this was um, a very experimental uh, decade for um, for Disney because they wanted to try something different rather than the formula that had worked for them for so long during the Renaissance period with their musicals. Um, and some some films did okay, others not as much. So it was a so as far. Uh, as far as the reception and the box office earnings for the films from this era are concerned, it, it was a bit of a mixed bag for um, um, it was a bit of a mixed bag for um, uh, for Disney. But um, nevertheless, let's um, yeah. Let's, well, uh, what, I, what I want to say as well is that like yeah. uh, I believe, I believe uh, Tarzan came out in nineteen ninety nine, correct? It did. So it did. Yes, that was the that was the last film. Uh, that was part of the uh, Renaissance era, which started yes. with The Little no. Mermaid back in 1989. 
Yes, so you can definitely tell with a year's difference how much different animation is compared to Tarzan and Atlantis. Yeah. So it shows, it shows that they're trying new things. Yeah, especially especially with um, especially with how much it was uh, costing um, Disney to make the uh, to make these films. Because uh, yeah. in th- in this case for Atlantis, uh, it had a budget of about ninety to one hundred and twenty million um, uh, dollars. But well, we'll get more into that with the legacy portion of the scores at the end of um, of the episode. So, with that being said, let's not waste any more time and let's jump. Let's um, let's embark on this epic voyage towards Atlantis. So, um. Let's just say they didn't waste any time getting started with their, the action set pieces because there's there's a huge tsunami that's approaching um, Atlantis right at the start of the film. And you've got people trying to head to the city to warn them. And uh, yeah, this tsunami wipes a lot of them out. And you've got you've got these uh, you've got these um, godlike um, statues that uh, put this protective force field over a portion of the city, uh, which ends up inadvertently trapping a lot of the uh, Atlantean citizens uh, outside the force field, and they end up being consumed by the tsunami. So that's one, that's one of a number of points that um, Jamie just brought up uh, just a moment ago uh, about how dark this film can get. So yeah, um, a, so a lot of people get killed in the, right out the gate. So... I'm- yeah, and, uh, some of them like you don't see them get killed because of the tsunami, but some of them you like fly into the force field and explode. So it's not exactly the most heartwarming start to the film. No, and and, you, and you've got people banging on the force field, just like just try to beg people, let me in. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, it's a bit of a chaotic start to the a film. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so we get so we've got a couple of so we got a couple of characters. Um, uh, to I- introduce you to um, here, folks, because uh, you've got uh, you've got Princess uh, Kida. Uh, I, ca- I can't remember how to pronounce the, uh, the full name, so we'll just go with Kida uh, uh, for the episode. I'm going. I'm probably going to butcher this. Is, but is it Karashnika? Something mm. along those lines. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I say. But uh, the young uh, Princess Kida is uh, voiced by uh, Natalie Strom. Uh, and we'll see. We'll see. We'll see the. Um, we'll see the uh, uh, the grown up. Uh, Kida uh, later on. Uh, her mother with uh, the crisp with the crystal around her neck. Now, keep the crystals in mind, folks. These are very pivotal for the plot. Um, the um, uh, the Atlant uh, the Atlantean um, gods or kings of the past or wh- whatever. Uh, they select her to be um, uh, t- to be chosen for um, being t- taken up into the. Um, into the, into the sky. Uh, you've also got the Atlantean King, who is voiced by the original Spock himself, Mister Leonard Nimoy, the late great Leonard Nimoy, um, who was uh, pitch- my mum. My mother loves Leonard Nimoy. It's a shame he's yeah. passed. <laughs> yeah, he passed away at the age of eighty three in uh, twenty fifteen. Just a few just a few weeks before what would have been his eighty fourth birthday in uh, twenty fifteen. But he has been very, um, he's been very prevalent in the Star Trek franchise, especially during the William Shatner era, both with the original TV series and, of course, the um, up to date movies. Yes, yeah. yes, the, the movies as well. Um, he was also in the um, he was also in the reboot trilogy as Spock Prime with. Um, uh, st- the Star Trek reboot in 2009 starring Chris Pine and Zachary Quinto taking the role of um, uh, of Spock and also Star Trek Into Darkness. Now, uh, Star Trek Beyond released in 2017 and this was a couple of, this was a couple of years after Leonard had um, passed away but they did pay tribute to him um, in the end credits of uh, Star Trek Beyond but um, he does have um he does have Disney credits to his name. Well, he's, he's even been in an episode of Family Guy. He's got over a hundred 
uh, acting credits uh, to his name. He was the voice of Spock in the Family Guy game, The Quest for Stuff in uh, 2014, which was the last role that he had. He was the Sentinel Prime in Transformers Dark of the Moon in 2011. Um, and he's he also... He was, was also in an episode of The Simpsons. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, look, every, everybody's been in The Simpsons at some point. No, I uh, suppose, yeah. Was it, uh, uh, he was also in an, a couple of episodes of Futurama. Um, and uh, he's also got a major Disney credit to his name in the form of being the voice of Master Xehanort in Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, which was originally released on the PSP in... 2010 now now i've done now i've done a kingdom hearts episode there previously folks where we did a, a tier list of all the worlds that have featured in the kingdom hearts series be it <coughs> films be it uh, the worlds created from the disney films or just original worlds created uh, for the game like uh, twilight town traverse town uh, hollow bastion well uh, places like that uh, if you haven't had a chance to check that out yet, uh, you can check out um, all the Kingdom of Isolation episodes that we've done so far in the top right of your screens. Um, he's got another video game credit to his name in the form of uh, being the narrator for uh, Civilization IV in uh, 2005. Now, so that, that's just that's just a number of um, that's just a number of the. Um, uh, credits that he has uh, as an actor the page master as well as dr jekyll and mr hyde in uh, 1994 starring macaulay culkin um so yeah his, so yeah, his, his most well-known role was of course as uh, spock uh, during the star trek uh, tv series that ran for 80 episodes uh, that ran between 1966 and 1969 he's been he was on the go as early as the 50s, possibly later than that, uh, possibly earlier than that, yeah. His first major role was uh, for a, a film called Queen for a Day as a chief in uh, 1951. So that was his first major acting role. He also he was also nominated for four primetime Emmys throughout uh, his career as, of course, uh, as, of course, the role of Spock. So... No big, so no big surprise there. He does have a few wins to his name as well, um, including a Saturn Award for Best Guest Performance in a TV Series for his guest appearance on uh, Fringe back in two thousand and eight. So, not a bad, not a bad career spanning, spanning just over six decades. It's a long time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Fair dues to him. So, yeah. So now, now, of course, in terms of Star Trek, folks, I grew up with uh, the Next Generation with uh, Patrick Stewart as Jean Luc Picard. Yeah. But, um, but, 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 but and, I, and I think part of that's the main influence as to why I prefer the Next Generation era over the the original uh, series, mainly because of the fact that I grew up with the Next Generation. But even at that, like I said, I enjoyed the uh, the reboot films. Uh, I, I actually went to see. I actually went to see. I, I've actually, I've seen all three of them, and they're absolutely fantastic. But, but anyway. I've seen, I didn't see Beyond, but uh, Into mm -hmm. Darkness freaked me out a little bit because Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, oh, Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch! Was, uh, oh yes, he was scary. As hell. He was for yeah, and 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 that's what makes him such a great actor. He was phenomenal in that role. He killed. He killed Robocop. Uh, yeah, but um. But of course, eighth. But of course, um, once the um, uh, once um, what's left of Atlantis anyway uh, goes underwater, we we are eight thousand years into the future in the year nineteen fourteen, uh, to be specific, at the uh, at the Smithsonian uh, Institute. Um, well, uh, he's. We, we get introduced to the main character himself, Milo Thatch, uh, who is dreaming about finding Atlantis, something that um, something that uh, his grandfather also um, tried to do as well. Now, 
in terms of uh, who actually voiced Milo, it's none other than Marty McFly himself, Michael J. Fox, who also has a couple of Disney credits to his name. He was the voice of the dog Chance in the two Homeward Bound films, which both both phenomenal, especially the first one, which that ending never fails to tear people up. But, um, but yeah. Yeah. He's had quite a few voice roles because of his unfortunate condition with Parkinson's. Uh, yeah. He he voiced Stuart Little in the original films. He did, yes. He has voiced uh, Stuart Little in the, uh, in the in the Stuart Little trilogy. You've got the first two uh, films that also starred Jonathan Lipnicki, <laughs> Gina Davis, and Hugh Laurie, and also the director video sequel Call, uh, Call of the Wild, and, which, and was, also, uh, which was animated. And also Timon himself, uh, uh, Nathan Lane, is... Snowbound. Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, Nathan Lane, uh, another uh, uh, Disney alum that was in uh, Stuart Little as well. And uh, another interesting Disney alum, as far as uh, who was involved with uh, the Stuart Little films was concerned, the first two in particular, is one of the directors of The Lion King, Rob Minkoff. Oh, no way. Yeah. So, what? So, a nice tight little family there. So, so, like I said, um, Michael J. Fox, I've actually brought his name up a couple of times previously in The King of Isolation. Um, I mean, granted, he doesn't have that, he doesn't have that many, um, uh, as many acting roles to his name uh, as, like, Leonard Nimoy. But uh, his most recent role was uh, the voice of Michael J. Bird in Back Home Again just last year. He reprised uh, his role as Martin McFly for... Uh, a music video by Lil Nas X, The Origins of Holiday. Um, what else? Is, uh, another one of his most well-known roles was, um, and this was around when, um, this was around the time that Back to the Future was just exploding in popularity when he was on, uh, so what, he, he started as himself in uh, uh, the, Annie remake in 2014. He he was Willie McFly and uh, Marty Future. That's what it says here on IMDb, folks. For the Back to the Future, um, for the Back to the Future Telltale game for the 30th anniversary edition in particular. Um, also, an an pretty well kind of unknown film that he was in that was really good. Is he? Yeah. I can't remember his exact name, but he was in a Vietnam War film, and uh, it's. He's uh, trying to get these soldiers that committed rape uh, to to jail because he's the good soldier and all that. And it's quite a heart wrenching film. Uh, so just checking out for those who don't know it. Now I can't remember the name of it. Which I, is th- really I, th- I, th- I think I might. I think I might have it here. Uh, it's a TV movie documentary from 1987. Well, I said I think this was what it is anyway. I might be wrong, folks. If we are, let us know in the comments. Uh, it says, "Dear America, let us home from Vietnam." That's the TV documentary. But then there's another war film he was in in 1989 as the um, as uh, the role of Ericsson, Casualties of War. That's it. That's it. There That's you it. go. There we go, folks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and Family Ties. He was in Family Ties. Bef- uh, started um, started as Alex P. Keaton, uh, which started in 1982, finished in 1989. He was doing Family Ties at the same time he was filming the Back to the Future films. So dedication to the cause. What can I say? Um, I, this... I believe I have a small fact about that. Uh, I could uh-huh. be wrong, uh, something if I'm wrong, but I believe they were committed to having Martin McFly be Back to the Future. But, but because of his commitments with Family Ties, yeah, they waited for him to finish filming Family Ties before they, he was brought on to do uh, Back to the Future. I'm fair. I'm fairly sure. I've, I'm pretty sure I've heard. Um, I'm pretty sure I've heard that somewhere before. As well. I, I, th- I think it might have been mentioned in, because um, I've got the Back to the Future trilogy box set, folks, and I think it was when they were trying to film Back to the Future 2 uh, that they they were talking about family ties, and uh, because of scheduling conflicts, they were, they, uh, like Jamie said, waiting until Michael finished filming uh, that particular season of Family Ties before getting him uh, into the, um, getting him in to do Back to the Future. And there's no denying, folks, that the Back to the Future trilogy is one of the greatest film trilogies that I've ever watched. 
And I'm going to be totally honest here. I might get shot for this, but I haven't seen number two all the way through yet. Right. Okay. Uh, I've seen now, three, but... Yeah. Now I'm f- I'm fairly sure I might be wrong on this one. They because uh, I know the Back to the Future films have been on Amazon Prime previously, so they might still be there. They might not. We'll wait and see what happens. But um, the same year Back to the Future came out, uh, he voiced Scott Howard. Uh, voiced, sorry, portrayed Scott Wolf. The same year Back to the Future came out in Teen Wolf. Oh, yes. That, that was blank from my memory, that, that film. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, as I've also got in here, the uh, the supervising uh, animators. Now, now in, my, in Milo's case, there was two supervising animators. You had John Pomeroy, who was one of the supervising animators, but then you have the senior supervising animator, uh, who was James Baxter in this case? Now, for those that are want, uh, for those that may be new to the Kingdom of Isolation and wondering what the supervising animator's job uh, is in terms of being involved with these films, it's to it's t- um, it's to ensure that the uh, the right um, characteristics and mannerisms uh, are applied to the relevant character that they're in charge of um, uh, of, of animating. Um, I mean, uh, one, one of the one of the biggest examples of that is uh, one of the biggest examples of that is uh, Eric Goldberg, who was the supervising animator for the Genie in uh, Aladdin back in 1992. Um, uh, and one of the one of the key things with um, being a supervising animator for the Genie, in particular for Eric, was when the Genie, voiced by the late Robin Williams, uh, was uh, pulling off all his uh, impressions. It's ensuring that depend depending on the impression that the genie was giving, uh, Eric Goldberg animating uh, the genie to um, look like the person that they're trying to imitate, like uh, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jack Nicholson, just a couple of examples there. Um, and um, so yeah, so so that so that's basically the job of the supervising animator, folks, to ensure that the. Uh, the the characteristics and mannerisms match what um, match what uh, the team are looking for um, when it comes to portraying the character as best they can. Um, especially, especially when you have especially when you have such a prolific actor like Michael J. Fox portraying the main character in in the film in this case. So. Uh, Milo is unfortunately ridiculed by the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, he, he's actually a linguist as well, because um, uh, of the dream of finding Atlantis. And everybody keeps telling him it's a myth; it's not real. You're not going to find it because of that. Um, but then Helga Sinclair um, leads um, Milo to. Pref- uh, Preston B. Whitmore, who's an old friend of uh, Milo's uh, grandfather. Now, uh, Helga, um, supervising animator for her, was Yosh- uh, Yoshimichi Tamura, and uh, she is portrayed uh, by uh, Claudia Christian. Uh, then you've got... Um, uh, where is he? Uh, John Mahoney uh, as the vo- voice of uh, Preston uh, Whitmore. Uh, the supervising animator for him is uh, David Puriksma, who also was the supervising animator for one of the other characters that we see uh, later on in the um, um, in the film. Now. One of the one of the char- one of the characters that ridicules um, Milo for his uh, dreams about finding Atlantis is somebody called uh, Mister Harcourt, who is voiced by uh, by another Disney icon, David Odgan Styers, who did films like uh, he was Cogsworth in Beauty and the Beast. He was. Um, mm-hmm. Governor Ratcliffe and his assistant Wiggins in Pocahontas. Uh, he was also <clears throat> the voice of uh, Jumba uh, Jumba Chukiba 
in Lilo and Stitch the the following year, uh, 2002, the uh, just a year after Atlantis came out. So he's he's an icon. He's a he's a Disney legend in in his own right. Um, he was also uh, so I've, I've brought up his name numerous times in the uh, at the Kingdom of Isolation with the films that he's um, uh, been in. Um, he was he was also in Mash between 1990, uh, 1977 and 1983, nominated for three primetime Emmys, and he's um, uh, he he passed away just a few years ago in twenty eighteen at the age of uh, seventy five. But like but like I said, he's he's a phenomenal actor, and if you if you haven't had a chance to check out some of his work outside of uh, Disney, um, de- definitely def- definitely give Mash a watch because he is just absolutely phenomenal with the roles he has had over the years but um but yeah uh whitmore decides to fund milo's expedition uh to atlantis and this is where we get introduced to the rest of the crew you've got commander rook uh and you've also got uh helga who we saw earlier um, you've got Vinny, who is a demolitions expert, geologist um, Moliere, <clears throat> Dr. Sweet, who's a medical officer, uh, Audrey, who's a mechanic, uh, and you've also got Mrs. Packard as the radio operator, and Cookie being, well, the chef. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, so there's a few. So there's a lot of names uh, to get through there. So let's uh, try and rattle through them quickly. Uh, James Garner, uh, the voice of Rook. Uh, Phil Morris as the voice of uh, Doctor Sweet. You've got Don Novello as the voice of Finney. Jacqueline Obradors as uh, Audrey. Florence Stanley as Mrs. Packard, and Jim Varney. This was his last role uh, before he passed away. Um. Yeah. Uh, as Cookie, Jim uh, Jim Varney, correct? Yes, uh, that's Jim Varney. Yeah, this yeah. was uh, J- this was Jim Varney's last role before he passed away. Uh, set because uh, he died just before finishing yeah. the film. No, and, <laughs> yeah, and it was um, and it was left to Stephen Barr, who did one of the last lines um, <clears throat> for uh, Cookie. The the I ain't so good at speechifying line. Uh, near the end of the film was the only line not spoken by Varney, and that was left to Stephen Barr to do the voice for that scene. Now, uh, now we mentioned earlier about how exper- experimental this decade was uh, for Disney. It says here as well that because the movie was planned out as an action adventure, the production crew wore T-shirts to work <laughs> that read Atlantis, fewer songs, more explosions. And they they definitely lived up to that. Yes. Now, and this is one of the biggest things when it came to researching. Um, this is one of the biggest things when it came to researching the film to make it. Uh, the filmmakers noted that the vast majority of their research about Atlantis was primarily done through the internet, sifting through all of the information they could find, both plausible and fictitious, to pick out what would work to facilitate the story they were telling as well as the mythology and world building they were creating. For the visual design, directors Kirk Wise and Gary Trousdale, who also directed uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame and Beauty and the Beast, immediately did not want Atlantis to be heavily influenced by the commonly used Greek look. Art director David um, uh, Goetz noted as part of the desire to illustrate the Atlantean civilization as being the mother culture of all of the civilizations of Earth, which we find out uh, in which we find out when the crew meet the Atlanteans for the first time, they looked into using they looked into the unusual architectural designs used in Southeast Asia, notably Cambodia, as well as the Mayan architecture found in South America. Further refinements were done in an effort to emulate the art style of production designer. Mike, Mike Mignola, the core production team took a trip to uh, the Carlsbad Caverns National Park in south, southeastern New Mexico 
during the pre-production stages of the film. This was done for research to get a better feel of what it is like to live underground. It is also it also provided inspiration towards the development of the caverns, the Whitmore expedition journeys through towards Atlantis. So just from that alone, they did a lot of research to be f- as faithful as possible to the Atlantean legends, while at the same time putting their own spin on it without without um, like it said there, relying on the um, traditionally uh, Greek look that uh, the Atlantean legend has been uh, well known for. So it's um, so we also get um, so we also get a little um, so we also get a little uh, um, so, so I mentioned about the supervising animators um, uh, early regarding uh, Milo in particular. This is one of this is one of the characteristics that they incorporated from Michael J. Fox into Milo's character. Um, as it says here, after Milo gets seasick on the first ship, and this is um, and this is just before he gets introduced <clears throat> to the rest of the crew. Um, his his line carrots. Why are there always carrots? I didn't even eat carrots. That was ad libbed by Michael J. Fox himself. So it's not it's not the first time we've heard people ad libbing in uh, Disney films. Robin Williams again. We've already mentioned him. James Woods in particular with Hercules, giving the animators an absolute nightmare trying to animate Hades um, uh, Hades scenes. Michael J. Fox is actually allergic to carrots. So I I find it funny because uh, the, the, the carrots uh, throw up joke isn't the first time I've heard it. Like I remember, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't remember personally because I wasn't there. But uh, I remember a Billy Connolly sketch back in the early 80s. Yeah. He was, uh, he was a standing up comedian and mm-hmm. he was just talking randomly and then he mentioned that uh, being drunk and thrown up and then he just stopped and says, how is it always that uh, when we throw up, there's always base carrots in it? Oh, that's brilliant. That yeah. is brilliant. Um, so uh, one of the other things that uh, Milo has on this you know, expedition, as well as getting the funding uh, and relevant stuff for the trip, um, he's given the Shepherd's Journal, which is a book <coughs> describing the history and path to Atlantis, and we find out that part of that path doesn't go through Ireland as was initially thought, and that's because it was a min- that's because it was a mistranslation, and it was the one left and one letter that ended up being a mistranslation. It was the R, and it was actually a C, thanks to the um, thanks to uh, Milo's work, and it turns out that's that the path goes through. Iceland instead. So, Sorry, I read you second best. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So yeah. Uh, so yeah. So yeah. So so I was saying that. So instead of the path, instead of the path to Atlantis going through Ireland, it was actually going through Iceland because of a mistranslation. So yeah, there's that. Um, and uh, Milo. I get I get the impression he's a bit of a religious guy himself because he talks a lot about uh, like references to uh, uh, to the Bible uh, throughout the film as well. In, in particular, the um, in particular uh, in particular somewhere through um, uh, the book of uh, uh, Job as well. Uh, if I can find it, yeah, here we go. Just as well, just as well, I get just as well, I got all my trivia notes typed up here, so. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I did, I did traditional. I've them down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Milo references the Book of Job uh, when he's describing the Leviathan, and this is early. This is the, when he's trying to um, get the funding for the exp- uh, for his expedition. Uh, the specific, um, the specific verse he paraphrases is, is Job uh, forty one nineteen. Now, I've got. I've got church scriptures in front of me as well right now. Um, and he paraphrases the <clears throat> King, the new King James version of, um, of that scripture. So I'm, I'm actually going to get it up just now. Uh, Job 41, 19. 
So it says, it says, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. So that's what so that's what that scripture says. And and the, and the crew end up encountering this uh, this Leviathan. And it's um, it's it's not some man. Uh, it's not some aquatic creature. It's an actual machine. So. Oh, my God, but even at that, even at that, Sky still. Sky and was around even back then. <laughs> yeah. But even then. This is a really cool action set piece, um, and 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 it and it ties into what I said earlier as well about how amazing the animation looks. Although there are some there there are some points here and there where, from from my perspective anyway, that some of the animation did look a bit cheaper than uh, than a lot of the other um, uh, yeah. pieces pieces sure. like the like. I said, there was a couple of moments where the animation looked a bit cheaper than, uh, say, the action set pieces. Now, now I, I, don't, I don't know why that would have been. I don't know why that would have been the case, but, um, but even at that, it but even at the action set piece alongside some other phenomenal shots in this film, uh, we get we get a phenomenal film score composed by James Newton Howard, who's done Disney projects previously as well. Uh, he did Dinosaur the year beforehand. He would go on to do Treasure Planet the following year. Mm. And one of his most well-known pieces of work is being involved with the Hunger Games franchise. And I'm not going to be surprised if he gets brought back on board to do the Ballad of um, Songs and Snakes, I think it's called, which is uh, which is the prequel to the uh, the Hunger Games films. Uh, so I'll double check that just now. Uh, ballad of songbirds and snakes that's what it is um so yeah uh yeah and it's uh yeah there is definitely going to be a film adaptation of uh this uh, this film um there's 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 no surprise it's going to be there's going to be a film adaptation of uh, the ballad of songbirds and snakes which is a prequel to the hunger games um series a film adaptation from Lionsgate said to be released in uh November next year. So that's oh. um so I've never, yeah. I've never heard of it that so yeah but um I'm I'm still a bit on the fence with how the Hunger Games films uh ended uh with with the ending of Balkan J Part 2. I was a bit I was a bit on the fence about um how that ended but uh, but even at that still Mocha J Part Two wasn't exactly the the best one out of the three. three? Yeah, was it? Yeah, uh, the, but, there was four. Oh, four. Sorry, but it, it just seemed a bit rushed to me. To be it, to be yeah, I, I I think I think that's probably one of my biggest biggest criticisms with their Part Two. It did feel rushed, but um, but of course this was this was during a phase where uh, the 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 final book of uh the final book of a series having to be uh, being split into two parts and that was done thanks to the success of um the deathly hallows for harry potter then twilight did it with breaking dawn hunger games doing it with mocking jay um and and, uh, and now hobbit. i see well. what was that the hobbit didn't they do one as well uh yeah, yeah. i see there was uh, i'm pretty sure there was only i'm pretty sure there was only two books in the uh, for the hobbit because uh, you also had the because you, you had the Lord of the Rings trilogy, um, because it was the second book, uh, it was the second Hobbit book, I believe. That's the one that got split into two films, um, but but even then, I'm I'm thinking to myself, you've got you've got a relatively short book, and you're splitting it splitting it into effectively two three hour films, and this is going by the extended editions, folks, as well. I say. Middle Earth fans, the Middle Earth fans are very adamant that you must watch extended version. Theatrical version does not count. But yes. anyway, but uh, yeah, um, even at that, even at that, still, like I say, this is a phenomenal set piece. Uh, the uh, the Ulysses is the is the name of the submarine, and that's one of the many. Um, ships that end up being destroyed by the live the Vith, and, and they lose a lot of their crew in the process it's a bit, a bit of a dark scene as well yeah 
Uh, that's it, that's it. And, it, and it's not and it's not the only dark scene that we're going to be getting in this film, folks. Um, but uh, yeah, um, after they manage to escape the Leviathan, um, they've only got a handful of um, survivors left, and that being uh, the characters we've already mentioned, Rook, Milo, um, and, and some of the miscellaneous crew uh, as well. And they end up finding themselves in a dormant volcano, which, um, yeah, it's a little concerning that uh, they're in a dormant volcano. Not an extinct volcano, a dormant volcano that could erupt at any moment. Just needs one big boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, but then, the, then... Uh, there's there's also a point there's also a point that they actually there's a point where they set up camp, um, the, uh, the um, the crew they they uh, they've been having a bit of fun at um, Milo's uh, expense. One particular example is inviting them over to sit next to them, and then they put a whoopee cushion under him just before he sits down. Which I mean, <laughs> I mean, let's face it. Let's say everybody's done that at some point. <laughs> yeah. one, one of my favorite scenes uh, leading up to that before the, the reconciliation is yeah. uh, when uh, I forget his name, the one that has all the explosives. Yeah, uh, I forget his name. Uh, I think that's uh, oh, that's uh, Vinny. Yeah, Vinny. Vinny, the yeah, demolitions expert. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Milo's drinking him some water, and he goes, "You just think <gasps> nitroglycerine? <laughs> yes." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is that is honestly brilliant. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. But um, but yeah, uh, this it's it it de it definitely gives you an idea. It definitely gives you an idea of um how amazing the chemistry is between um uh, between the crew who have known each other for a long time. Uh, and then you've so you've got there's a there's a fair bit of responsibility on um uh, Milo's shoulders now because he's the only one that's got like the knowledge thanks to the Shepherd's Journal on how to get to Atlantis um once they've um managed to escape the Leviathan uh but um yeah the then the um. Then you end up with uh, fireflies effectively infiltrating the camp, if you will, and uh, setting everything on fire. I do. Uh, before we get, I do like the before we get into the whole setting fire. I do like them. Like uh, I felt heartwarming that they're talking about their past lives and all. Oh that. yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, Vinny, like a big explosive man, worked in a flower shop. You would never have seen that coming. <laughs> no, no, abs absolutely. You definitely wouldn't yeah. have seen that coming. And. Uh, <laughs> And I, 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 lo I love the fact as well that they just they um that Milo's curious about what Mo um yeah, Mole's Mo. story is. You don't want to know. Don't yeah. Tell me. And, and 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 they just leave it at that. They they actually leave it at that. They don't tell us his story. <laughs> RJ, don't tell him. You shouldn't have told me, but you did. So but <laughs> you, you don't want to know. Oh, I mean, I mean, Doctor Sweet is probably. Out of everybody, I say like, he's the most likable character. Oh, uh, absolutely, Doctor Sweet is probably the he's probably my personal favorite out of them. Um, out of everybody that's um, that's there, um, I say like, even even he's been involved in the uh, the Star Trek franchise at one point as well. He was trainee Foster in the Star Trek film The Search for Spock in uh, 1984. Meet the Spartans. Uh, a Justice League film in 2012, Young Justice as Lawzord in uh, just earlier this year. I, I've seen Justice League, but I don't remember who he voiced. Yeah. Was it? Was it like that? Was uh, that was Law? Um, oh, oh, the the 2012 Justice League. Uh, Vandal Savage. That was his name. Hmm. Sorry, I had a blank memory of that. <laughs> uh, it's it's okay. Yeah, but um, but yeah. Uh, oh, he's he's, he's got a video credit. He's got a video game credit to his name as well. Um, Lyndon um, Javis in the 2020 game Star Wars Squadrons. Oh, I haven't played that. Uh, 
good for him. He's uh, he's he's got some more notability than the one would have realized. Yeah, yes, and, and and that and that's the great and that's one of the biggest things I love about going uh, going through the um, the filmography that these um, that these cast members have. You find these roles and uh, that that they've done, and you're just like, oh, so that's so that's where they've been before as well. Yeah, it's like, oh, I've seen that. Oh, that's who, that's where he's from. Stuff like that. Yeah. I was, like, I was like, it's not the first time that's happened. I, I actually remember, I actually remember picking up on that when I was younger. I was, I was just like, wait a minute, I've either a seen him, bef- seen them before, or b heard that voice somewhere before. Yeah, yeah. So, and then you get a moment of happiness, and like he was one of your, for example, favorite films in the past, and you're like, oh no way, he's in that. Yeah. See, is it? Was, I love it. So, but yeah. Um, I say James Garner, um, another another notable legend. He's he's had a few notable roles to his name. Uh, the Notebook in two thousand and four, The Great Escape, alongside Steve McQueen in nineteen sixty three, Space Cowboys. Um, he's got a few DC credits to his name as well. Um, he was on the um, he was on the uh, TV series Eight Simple Rules, which I'm pretty sure I might be wrong on this one. Also starred um, uh, Kelly Kuko before she was on The Big Bang Theory. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you may be right, but I'm not entirely familiar with Ace and Bubbles, so. Yeah, uh, he was. Uh, say, uh, James Garner. He was nominated for a Best Actor uh, for his role in Murphy's Romance in 1985. So, so yeah. I mean, I mean, just from that alone. I mean, you've got a phenomenal cast, a phenomenal cast. There, you got Michael J. Fox, there, very prolific actor with a lot of well-known roles. James Garner, an Oscar nominee, an Oscar nominee. Disney legend David Ogden Styles. So, so overall, overall, it's a fantastic cast. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Disney is quite known for bringing in some big names for the nineties and two thousands uh, movies. Oh, they did, yeah. Uh, now. Yes, Corey Burton, the voice of um, the voice of Mole. Now, he's done he's done a number of Disney projects previously as well. He was he was the voice of the Titans in Hercules back in nineteen ninety seven. My favorite Disney film of all time, folks. I just plug in that whenever I can. Uh, yeah. He 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 was in he was in the Transformers movie in nineteen eighty six. Uh, he was Hugo Strange. In uh, Batman: Arkham City in 2011, so he's got, so he's too got a, um, he's also got a, a DC a video game credit to his name. Uh, Ludwig von Drake is one of his most well known roles right now. Uh, the voice of Count Dooku in the uh, Star War in Lego Star Wars: The Skywalker Saga, which I'm pl- which I'm going through on my Switch right now, and it is. Fantastic! It's uh, I, I remember back in the day of the PS2 era, where Lego Star Wars was one of the biggest, you know, games. Oh yeah, as every everybody everybody loves them. Um, I was like, I'm yet to come. Game. I'm yet to come across somebody that doesn't like the uh, the Lego games. Um, he was also the voice of Yen Sid and Ansem in uh, the Kingdom Hearts game Melody of Memory in. Uh, 2020. He's also the voice of Engine in uh, uh, Crash Bandicoot, uh, Crash Bandicoot Four, uh, to be uh, exact, right now. Um, so he's um, so yeah, he's he's been very busy, not just with um, not just with films, but also uh, TV and video games uh, as well. So very diverse range for Corey Burton. Um, yeah. Fair, fair this time, he's got some quite noble roles. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, now, uh, there's a lo- there's a number of um, now there's a number of uh, n- names in terms of the cast uh, that were considered for numerous roles. Uh, you had Tim Curry considered for the voice of the King of Atlantis. Pennywise himself. Yep. Everything. Yeah, Pennywise, he was also in Rocky Horror. Um, he was also the, the hotel manager in uh, Home Alone 2. Ah, yes. Yeah. Um, 
he was also um, uh, Ben Ravencroft. This is for the Scooby Doo fans out there in the director video film Scooby Doo and the Witch's Ghost. Now, 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 and uh, now I've I've seen all the uh, the director video. Now I've seen uh, the the main four director video Scooby Doo films: Zombie Island, Witch's Ghost, Alien Invaders, and uh, the Cyber Chase. The Cyber Chase in particular is the one I remember watching the most uh, when I was younger, but. I would say my personal favorite out of um out of the out of the four would probably be Zombie Island, although Cyber Chase does come a close second for me because of the um because of how much I watched it as a kid. Um Commander Rook also had a number of uh, names considered for um uh, to portray him. Tommy Lee Jones and Jack Davenport being um a couple of the names, uh, as well as Believe it or not, folks, he's a Disney legend himself. Kurt Russell, who voiced a copper in The Fox and the Hound. Hmm. Uh, Kurt Russell is a big name in terms of uh, films. Yeah, he's a, yeah, he's a massive. Is it? Um, he was in the original the the thing. In, yeah, uh, uh, and nineteen eighty two. Nineteen eighty two. Yes. Uh, uh, a lot of people have said that even even James A. Janice from uh, Dead Meat has said that it's one of his favorite horror films of all time, uh, and, and, it's, and, it, and it's hard to argue with that. Um, some of the other names that were considered for the role of um, uh, Commander Rook were Heath Ledger, Josh Brolin, Harry Shearer, and Joaquin Phoenix. Interestingly, so honestly, hearing Commander now. Compared to those names he mentioned, I can't imagine him being any of those people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, so, Tommy Lee Jones, uh, I've got to admit, does sound similar to the yeah. voice of the. I keep forgetting his name. I do apologize, but <laughs> uh, Commander Rock. Yeah, yeah. So, and then, and there was a, and there, oh my word, yeah, there, there was a huge list of names that were considered for. Uh, the role of Milo, uh, and these include and these included. So this is an extensive list. Bear with me, folks. Jason Schwartzman, Toby Maguire, Brecken May- Meyer, Jim Carrey, Harry Enfield, Nicholas Cage, Brad Pitt, Jason Lee, Jamie Ker- Kennedy, um, uh, Goran Vizincic, and Kevin Spacey. That's a very extensive list of names that were considered for the role of um of Milo. Now a couple of those names have been involved in Disney projects previously. Uh Kevin Spacey being one of them who was the voice of Hopper in A Bug's Life back in 1998 for Pixar. Yeah. No way. Yeah. And uh and uh, and Toby Maguire, of course, he would have been busy at the time filming Spider-Man. So um don't think he would have been uh, able to find the time to voice uh Milo at the same time. But, everyone's um, favorite Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. Well, most everyone's. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a few, there was a couple, uh, some, some other names that were uh, considered, uh, this time for the role of uh, of Maul. Uh, Chris Rock being one of the biggest names considered for that role, and uh, Ben Miller, as well as well as the likes of uh, Bernard, uh, uh, Bernard Farsi and uh, D.L. Uh, Hewley. So... Quite a few names considered for a number of different roles. This uh, one thing I can think about this is this film was definitely very thought out of who to get and, and stuff like that. It, it was very uh, uh, thoughtful film, you know. Everyone, yeah, and a lot of that is, um, and a lot of that is down to uh, the casting uh, directors, uh, Mary. Mary Hidalgo and Ruth Lambert, they, they were the casting directors. Uh, and of course, casting directors, that, that's a Ron Seal job, does what it says in the tin. Uh, they, um, the casting directors are the ones in charge of getting the right people to voice these characters. And more often than not, they actually managed to pull off, they actually managed to get the casting right. And then you've got the odd occasional two where you're just like, hmm... I'm not sure if I would have chosen them. I would have chosen somebody else. I mean, but that's that's like a rare occurrence in in the field of um in the field of animation. It's very rare that you find somebody that doesn't suit their role. 
Um, but I, I do believe Michael J. Fox was uh, the best choice of for Milo. Oh, ab- absolutely, yeah. That's it, because because it does. It does remind uh, the way he portrays Milo. It does remind you of his other roles, like uh, yeah. say, the roles that I've mentioned there previously already. So, so at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they did a good job with uh, Michael J. Fox, and I feel he did a great job portraying uh, portraying Milo. His voice um, definitely matches the character as well. Oh, de- oh, abso- absolutely, and it. Absolutely, and it's and it's not it's not very often that we actually that, I, that, I, that we actually bring that up that the um, that the voice matches the character. I said, like, like, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I've heard people say that when they've been with me in the Kingdom of Isolation previously, but uh, I'm, I might be drawing I might be drawing a blank on how many times it's been mentioned, but yeah, um, but yeah, J- Jamie's right. The voice does match the character really, really well. So, so then we, um, so then we get that stunning shot of the crew seeing Atlantis for the first time, and the score at this point phenomenal from um, there from Howard. What one fact I learned about that? You know the the as you're looking at Atlantis, yeah, it's actually shot in widescreen. It's just so they can get actual all the details. Right, like all different kind of details in the sides. Yeah. And stuff like that. Yeah. So that's pretty good thinking in terms of Disney animation at the time. Yeah, because like, because uh, this was during this was during a point where they were starting to do more films in in that widescreen um, uh, ratio compared to the uh, uh, the four three ratio that we um, that we had that we've been familiar with for so long. Um, is it says it and um, uh, this and Big Brother were the only um, Walt Disney Animation Studio films of the 2000s to be shot in the 2.35 to one aspect ratio, as well as being one of the one of only four Disney animated films feature uh, Disney animated feature films of the 2000s not to be produced at the 1.85 to one. Uh, ratio along with Lilo and Stitch and Home on the Range. And it was the second film to be um, shot in that uh, 2.35 ratio uh, after uh, Titan AE, which uh, came out the year beforehand. So, so, so it's not, it's not very often I go into the, um, into those sort of uh, technical behind the scenes stuff, but um, it, it is, it is worth noting that this is one of the first, Disney animated films to be shot in that widescreen ratio that we uh, that we all know today. Yeah. And you mentioned as well the, the the score as they're looking onto the oh yeah. Uh, a fun fact about the composer for that he was also he also did some composing for the Dark Knight and also Treasure Planet. Uh, yeah, as I, as I, I, I mentioned, um, I mentioned some of uh, James Newton Howard's work um, uh, earlier. So yeah, James Newton Howard. Wait, he helped hands up over the Dark Knight. Well, that's for a fact I've learned today. Yeah, on the wow. on the, on the internet. Oh my word! How's about that? Yeah, I say I say I say Treasure Planet. I already mentioned them um, earlier, and whew, after my first view in a Treasure Planet, I was just like, yeah, this is now one of my favorite Disney films of all time because um, every, uh, everything from how amazing it looks to the score and just the whole scope of Treasure Planet as a whole is absolutely amazing. And going off topic slightly, if, if you're ever doing a future episode with uh, Treasure Planet, you've got to hit me up because that's one of my favorite films of all time. So I'll be sure, I'll be sure to get, I'll be sure to get that. Uh, I'll be sure to get that done at. Uh, it's such an underrated gem. Oh, oh, ab- absolutely. And I said, and I've, I've, off, I've brought it up numerous times and I'll bring it up again. The biggest reason it didn't do as well at the, at the box office as Disney wanted was because of the films that were out at the time, including Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. Now, any- and also Finding Nemo as well. Uh, Finding Nemo came out the year bef- uh, the year afterwards in 2003. Was it? Yeah. Am I, am I that old? Can I not remember what you Unless, unless... Unless, because Disney did have a tendency back then 
to have different release dates for uh, the US release compared to the UK release uh, instead of them um, uh, having them released. Sure. At the same. I say that 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 might be the case. I'm, I'm I, I could be totally wrong, but I definitely think I heard that somewhere. Yeah. Well, um, we'll we'll double check that when we cover the Treasure yeah. Planet episode, folks. We'll we'll, we'll yeah, double we'll check get, that next. We'll, do, we'll, we'll double check that with the Treasure Planet episode, folks. So don't worry about that. Um, but yeah. Um, so uh, the crew get introduced to. Uh, Atlantis, and this is where we see uh, the adult uh, Princess Kira, who's voiced by Cree Summer, with um, with uh, her supervising uh, animator being. This is one of the drawbacks of having that many behind the scenes notes here. <laughs> um, uh, Randy Haycock being the supervising animator for um, for him, and um, I say one of her well known. Um, uh, one one particular role that I remember her having when um, uh, this was this was around about the same time that uh, Atlantis was uh, that Atlantis came out. She was also on the kids TV series Clip at the Big Red Dog, based on the popular book series, oh. popular kids book series, as the voice of Cleo, one of them, um, one of Clifford's friends. So that, I say now I remember watching. I remember watching that uh, that show a lot um, uh, when, when I was uh, when I was younger, and uh, and I I even watched it with my, my younger sisters at the time uh, as well. So uh, Milo speaking to um, Kida in the Atlantean uh, language, and then and then makes it makes another biblical reference, talking about the uh, mentioning the, the Tower of Babel because of them. Um, how the Atlanteans know all these languages that they're based on a root dialect from um, uh, from somewhere, and he said just like the Tower of Babel, and but yeah, um, so Kida, uh, uh, yeah, so father, who is the uh, the Atlantean king, uh, isn't too pleased about Kida bringing in these uh, outsiders uh, to Atlantis. But um, um, but then l- later on, uh, when you see Milo and uh, Kida spending time together, getting to know each other, and Milo learning more about the Atlantean um, uh, culture, um, I say th- this is another one of those cases of uh, the chemistry between the characters working really well. And again, a lot of that's down. Da- a lot of that is down to the casting. At the end of the day, um, being able to being able to help these characters feel as real and authentic as possible. I mean, I mean, granted, even though they're animated characters, they feel like real people when they when they are portrayed at such a high level. Uh, and then, and then once they've um, then once Milo learns about um, learns about the uh, the heart of Atlantis, which is a huge crystal. Um, in this case, uh, the heart of Atlantis gives people gives the people of Atlantis the longevity, and once powered their devices via smaller crystals that they all wear around their necks, and that's and that's one of the reasons why I've got the uh, my uncharted ring um uh, wearing the uncharted ring right now. As it because I mean yes, it's not an Atlantis it's not an Atlantis s crystal, but uh, it's 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 the best thing I could find. So, <laughs> but but even but even the I say, regardless of whether this is an uncharted ring or the the Atlantis crystals that we see in the film, the the symbolism, the symbolism, yeah, if you will, of um, imagine viewers. <laughs> yeah, I say, I say, um, I hate to, I hate to go off on a tangent for a brief moment, but uh, in, I say just go into DreamWorks to quote the fairy godmother from uh, Shrek Two: "Use your imagination." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when Milo gets back to the surface. Oh boy, this was a this was a thing Disney and Pixar loved loved to do at the time, having these twist villains. Now, yes, but uh, my goodness me, Rook turns out to be the villain because oh, you mean he's me? the only one, even though the rest of the crew say early on in the film yeah, that only in it for the money. Told you so. But it was and oh boy, well, now you know. he ends up he ends up fatally 
uh, wounding the Atlantean king, fatally shooting him, uh, to be exact, uh, after... Uh, of, he doesn't actually shoot me. He hits him in the back of the head with a gun. Uh, yeah. And so when, when, when the king refuses to give up the location of where the crystal is. Um, but he, end, he, ends up, he ends up finding the chamber anyway. Um, but um, this... Ne- next to next to that next to that shot of uh, seeing it, uh, the crew seeing Atlantis for the first time, this is probably another one of the another one of the best shots of the entire film, where you've got the crystal that Kida is wearing, mer- the crystal merging with Kida in this case, and it looks. Absolutely amazing, and and once and once that and once that once the merge is complete, um, she she ends up going into one of these um, uh, transport containers so that the crew can uh, take her back to the surface. This is when Milo manages to convince the crew to turn on Rook, effectively. And then Rook just simply saying, okay, more for me then. M- Mrs. Packard says it best. Uh, we're all going to die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, she, she doesn't say much, but she's still a great character regardless. The voice makes it funny. Uh, yeah, the, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't need to say much to get her point across. And and, and that's one of the biggest reasons why I love characters like that. They don't say much, but what they do say, they get their point across with not saying much. Sometimes even the minor characters can be the most uh, funny. Yes. And yeah. Of, of, um, of, 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 uh, I actually brought it up when I, when I uh, put together my top 10 films of uh, 2022 uh, so far. Uh, and this is from uh, January through to June, uh, that first half of the year. Uh, when I talked about turning red, yes, May is the main character, but Abby is the one that ends up stealing the show. She's one of the minor. She's one of the more minor characters, but yet she ends up stealing the show with just how expressive she is, and she's probably my favorite character of the entire film because of that. I, I do like movies where the the. They, they don't show the side character a lot more, but you can be, have a, a big laugh at them constantly. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like la- laughing with them, not at them, if you will. Yeah. So, so, so in the end, um, everybody, everybody turns on Rook except uh, Helga and um, the soldiers that Rook has. Uh, they, uh, they, start to, they start to head towards the surface and end up destroying the bridge that um, that they have just crossed. Um, and the Vinny with one of his best lines, like, don't go yet, pull back, kaboom. Okay, now you can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but how's he gonna get across though? Yeah. And this and this is and this is a great call. This gives us a great callback to um something that um, Milo managed to teach Kida early on in the film on how to power the Atlantean vehicles that they have. Uh, but but before but before the before before that, uh, you have uh, the king who ends up um, passing away from his injuries. Doctor Sweet saying internal bleeding. Not really much he can do beyond that. But um, the king ends up giving Milo his crystal and uh, an inspirational speech uh, yeah onwards yeah to give the crystal yeah and uh, and, and, I, and I actually and I actually put in my, in, in my notes I actually put in my notes here wow that's a hell of a responsibility on his shoulders <laughs> to it's it's up to Milo now to save Atlantis and I'm, and yeah like I say that's a hell of a responsibility on his shoulders this uh Mind your own business. Suddenly, you're the leader of all mankind in terms of Atlantis. Yeah, 
Yeah, I say it's another one of those cases of the "you are the chosen one" uh, trope, uh, which, which we've seen numerous times before. But um, but but even at that, this is this is one of those occasions where it does work because he's been looking for he's been looking for Atlantis for as long as he can remember. He finds it and then realizes what um, realizes it's actually better to keep. Uh, the heart of Atlantis where it is rather than taking it and effectively wiping out the entire civilization. I think uh, what we don't know is uh, that, or what we didn't realize at the time, is that none of the uh, crew knew that there were still people there in Atlantis. They just thought they were going there to witness, you know, ancient history, like, you know, pots, stuff like that. Yeah. Monuments. No, never realized that there was a whole set of civilization still there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that, and and that, and that's and that's and that again, tying to the, tying to the shot that I mentioned earlier. It's one of the biggest reasons why they were just like in awe of when when they when they saw Atlantis for the first time. Yeah, they were like, I say that that would have, I was like, without even seeing it, they'd have been like, this is not why I expected Atlantis to be. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um. I say. I say. Uh. I say. Going back to the speech that you um that you mentioned earlier, uh, Jamie, it says that um he said uh the king says in his speech that uh, the crystal must have a royal host when the city is in danger, and that's mm. where and that's where Princess Kira comes into the equation regarding that because her mother was because her mother was the queen at um when the events at the start of the film took place um and beg and he beg i say he effectively begged Milo to save Atlantis and Kida who will be lost to the crystal forever if not separated from it in time so yeah like i said it's a hell of a responsibility on his shoulders one um, thing I've, one thing i've never really understood is that is it only in t- times of danger that the city chooses a royal host to protect and then doesn't give them, give them back? I think that... M- <sighs> That's an interesting point. They, they, they never really... They never, they never really, really give a reason why they are taking royal hosts. Yeah, they, they never really explain that. Uh, they never really explain that point uh, really well, but... Um, but, well, um... Mm. But, 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 but even even at that, um, um, but even at at, the, at this point in the film, the, uh, he we do get an explanation as to as to, as to what happens when um, somebody royal ends up uh, yeah. passing away. But um, so the machine, uh, they Milo Milo his crew and the Atlanteans. With the help of the uh, the crystals, they manage to get these machines back up and running, uh, and they end up they manage to help uh, take down um, Rook. Uh, well, they manage to take down them um, um, Rook's soldiers, um, and oh boy! And uh, before we just go into it, because something just popped on my, up in my head. Yeah. Now, see when the Kida is taken away. Mm-hmm. We we see a shot of the crystals light disappearing. Now is that them not working or is that them just light going? I think I think that's the case. I think in that case, it's a case of uh, the the um, uh, the crystals power going dormant for the time being. If I say, if I say but. But then I see a shot later of them working their vehicles with the crystals, which is a bit questionable in my mind. Yeah. I mean, it's not meant to be perfect, but it's just confusing a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, nevertheless, um, nevertheless, once the um, once the uh, comedy fight is uh, out mm-hmm. of the way, which was like uh, another trope that they did during the, uh, the Renaissance, they had the, uh, the comedy fight before the big final confrontation. Uh, Rook ends up turning on Helga and uh, ends up killing her. Did she actually die, though? 
Well, we don't we 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 don't see it at the end of the film, so I can only assume. Uh, it. Uh, yeah, because because she got she got thrown off the the airship that Rook's on with the uh, with Kida yeah. inside that trans uh, transport container. Um, she she gets thrown off and uh, ends up hitting the ground. And considering how high up they were, yeah, you're not. Yeah, nobody's surviving that fall. Yeah. And nothing, then he's, nothing personal. Yeah. Nothing personal, just business at the end of the day. And then she says nothing personal and then manages to shoot uh, the airship as well. After Milo manages to get onto it to confront Rook, uh, he tries to use what looks like an axe on Rook. Uh, Milo, sorry. Smashes the um, uh, the window yeah. um, on, the, on the container. Um, yeah. I don't know if the crystal's power ended up tra- uh, transferring onto that glass or not, but I can only assume it did. If I could take a random guess, like just as Kida is like enclosed in the thing, you see like what looks like icing up. Now uh, I'm assuming maybe that might that might be the case. Yes, uh, it might be on the glass. You know, like condensation, for example. Uh, gla- uh, I don't know, electric content yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. It's hard to describe, but yeah. Yeah, so, but, but it, 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 it's another one of those things where I don't think it was really explained as to... Uh, yeah. But but even, but even at that still, we end up with one, a terrifying transformation and two of dark death, even by Disney standards. If I'm going to be honest, I think uh, this is one of the most darkest Heroes' deaths, uh, sorry, villain deaths in Disney in general. Yeah, and and that and that and that's against some very stiff competition as far as dark Disney deaths and are concerned. To be brutally honest, I'm surprised they got away with one day with uh, Clayton and Tarzan. Mm. I was just about to bring that one up because all you see from Clayton's death, he's hung by the vines. You see the machete hit the ground. Tarzan goes to the ground. Flash of lightning. And all you see is Clayton's corpse hanging in the trees in nothing but shadow. Yes. Uh, granted, they didn't show the body, but at the same time, it's still a bit dark. Yeah. Dark. But, 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 but I think I think Tarzan's expression at that point pretty much summed it up perfectly at that point. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. <sighs> Uh, in terms, of, in terms of Atlantis, that's another explanation. Like, there's no real, like, why did uh, rock turn blue and go crystally and all that? There was no real explanation into why, to what, what it is in general. And I, and I think, I think a lot of that is, I think a lot of that is down to some of the, um, what's it? I think a lot of that might be part of the part of why the film got criticised. Um, Yes. Uh, where where uh, some like some of, some of these key plot points weren't really explained, or yeah, if happens, or if there was an explanation, it wasn't a clear enough explanation for anybody to understand. But um, something happened. Watch it, see it, understand it. Nope. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But um, but despite but despite that though, it is it is still a pretty terrifying moment where you see Rook transform into this crystal monster. Uh, and then he gets hit by the um, the fan blades, ends up going kaboom, <laughs> boom. <laughs> yeah. And then and uh, and also the noise the noise the rook makes when he, the you know the squeezing. Yikes! <laughs> yeah. yeah, that kind of that kind of freaked me out as a kid back then as well. And I can I can I can only imagine you. Wo- I, I guarantee you wouldn't be alone on that one, but. Flip, but yeah, um, and it's thanks to all of that, alongside a couple of other things on top of that, the volcano ends up starting to erupt. The volcano, she wakes. <laughs> <laughs> Mole's di- Mole's dialogue is just absolutely, absolutely yeah. brilliant. Uh, um, I like that you have disturbed the dark. <laughs> Uh, as it's in Milo's bed, that was that was one of my favorite lines. Uh, yeah, that's it. And then, um, I say, and, and and part of that is part of that's down to the um, 
down to the incredible team that uh, managed to uh, get the story put together for this film, as well as uh, the man who wrote the screenplay, because because the, the directors also helped with the story alongside um, uh, Bryce and Jackie Isabel, uh, the, uh, the the writer of the screenplay, Tab Murphy. And one interesting name is uh, Josh, Josh Whedon. He's one of oh. he's one of the people in charge of he's one of the people that helped with the story for this film. Uh, he's now he's had a very he's had a very varied uh, career. Um, he was the writer for shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and its spinoff Angel, uh, Cabin in the Woods, uh, and then the Avengers the following year. Uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, the 2017 Justice League film, and we'll just put that to the side because the Zack Snyder Justice League film is the far superior film. Yes. Granted, it's over four hours long, but it is worth the four hours. I am going to get shot again. I've seen the original one, but I haven't seen the Zack Snyder one yet. Uh, yeah. Was it, well, was it, well, like I said, it is definitely worth the watch. I'll need, I'll need to watch it at some point soon. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to find. It, I'm sure you'll be able to find it somewhere, be it um, on, be it on a streaming service or Disney or, Plus. Because uh, no, because it's Warner Brothers. Oh yeah, I, I forget DC. Uh, Marvel is Disney, not DC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, oh my I've, god, I've got oh, friends. But yeah, but yeah, talking of Warner Brothers. They've cancelled a Scooby Doo film and they've cancelled a Batgirl film as well. Yeah, I've, I heard. Uh, I heard recently that there was a Batgirl in motion, but and like, I I might sound really biased here, but there's there's a lot of movies coming out in the future that have turned that are turning like male heroes into girls. Like, I know Batgirl was a thing in the past, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No one's no one really thought about making a girl version of the movie, like the Batman. Franchise, pretty good. Mm-hmm. It's a bit stale right now, but it's, it was decent. It oh point. yeah, especially especially the Dark Knight trilogy, which you mentioned earlier. Yeah, and then uh, now, and they're going to be making a girl version, and I'm assuming that the creators will think this will do good compared with the good ones in the past. Yeah, but, I, mean, I must admit, Ghostbusters, it didn't work. Oh, Ghostbusters! Oh no, 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 no! Ghostbusters 2016 didn't happen. It doesn't exist. It's yes. not canon. Thankfully, yes. But Ghostbusters, to... Ghostbusters Afterlife, though. I, I'm glad they saw like the, I'm glad the creator saw the error of the ways and created Afterlife because that was so much better. Oh yeah, and the fact that they managed to get the original, uh, t- uh, the original Ghostbusters in as well was mm. such a fantastic moment. Uh, did you know? Uh, oh, I forget the actor who plays him. Uh, J. Jonah Jameson, uh, the actor who plays him. Uh, I forget his name. Uh... Oh, oh, J.K. Simmons. Yeah, he was he was actually the the, the king, the for like a split five minutes. Yeah, I, I've got to admit the creativity in Afterlife is pretty damn decent. Yeah, and um, as a, and, and on top of that, it's no surprise that there's an Afterlife sequel on the way. Yes, I heard about that. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Oh yeah, ab- absolutely, yeah. But um, but yeah, um, thankfully, I see the I see these um. Uh, these uh, the, these totem statues that we met that we um, that I mentioned earlier, they they they, they, get, they come back into action. They they get this force field over um, Atlantis, and and they might they manage to they manage to save the city. They manage to get it back up and manage to they manage to restore it to its former glory, effectively. Um, but then, but um, I see the. Uh, the merge of the Crystal and Kida is um, uh, uh, is is finished there, uh, and then was like uh, Kida Kida turns back into a human form, and uh, Milo Il- Milo elects to stay, um, which is um, which is which is a, a bit of a bit of a bittersweet moment for the um, for the crew, given how much time they've spent with him uh, throughout this film. Uh, and a lot of that's down to the fact that um, uh, Kida and Milo ended up developing um, a romantic relationship when they were spending time together uh, earlier on in the film. 
the rest return to the surface, uh, promising to keep their adventures. There's a bit of a, a bit of a strange age gap. I mean, she's eight thousand years old compared to his. his she, 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 she looks pretty damn good for 8,000 <laughs> years old. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, that's it. Uh, I said the crew end up um, going back to the surface, promising to keep um, their adventures secret for, for the sake of uh, preserving Atlantis's safety. Um, but, uh, but they do get one last. They do get one last um, shot of everybody together uh, with with some of the uh, the treasures. They're going to be taken back up to the surface. Um, the photos are take the photos taken by Mrs. Picard, and then you've got, and then you've and then and then one of the um, and then you get this small package for um uh, for Whitmore. Uh, and that package has the uh, the crystal, one of the Atlantean crystals, and it and it ends up being a gift from uh, from Milo, and he sent and he gives him a, and he gives him a note saying uh, saying hope that this is enough proof for you for the uh, uh, proof that Atlantis does exist. Oh, here you got me some jewelry. Now where's the phone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but say but um, but say. But, say, but taking into account the fact that Whitmore was close friends with uh, Milo's granddad, um, so I think, and, and, I think yeah. Mr. Whitmore is an underrated character. So yeah, he's quite uh, motivational. That's what I'm saying. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So, so he was. I so say he he wanted he wanted to find Atlantis alongside uh, Milo's granddad, and and that Atlantean crystal. Uh, in Milo's eyes, is more than enough proof for Whitmore to show that they found Atlantis, and here's proof it exists. Uh, and um, and and then we and then we just get and then we finish the film with like one last shot of uh, uh, Atlantis of Atlantis in all its glory once again, and then. Um, I did find it a bit comical with that. So, yeah, so Mr. Redmore says to the crew, so, you didn't find anything, did you? And then they cussed them her covering gold. Yes! They, they, they try and make up all these, they try and make up all these excuses as to uh, what happened to everybody, like Rook as well. The nervous breakdown line, that was brilliant! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the, um, Let's see, but then over the end credits, uh, we have um, a, a song that was uh, written by uh, Diane Warren, uh, "Where the Dreams Take You," which uh, I said I, 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 I actually had it on. I actually had I actually just uh, kept the credits on in the background just to hear the song, and I thought this this song sounds really good. Yeah, like some like the two thousand end credits to Disney, most Disney films actually are really like really really good. Treasure Planet as well. That, uh, I know I'm getting oh, back to it. Oh, yeah. That song, that's really heartwarming. Oh, yeah. You know and then, and, and, and don't worry, folks, we are going to, we are going to talk, we are going to talk a lot about how amazing Treasure Planet is. Yes. Yeah, someone else has realized uh, how good it is. Yeah. That's because like, let's just put it this way. If Treasure Planet were released today, it would be, I guarantee it would be a huge box office hit. It's, like you, you look back at old Disney films and think, "Oh, this animation is a bit bad." If you look at it now, but Treasure Planet would still work. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. But but the thing, but this is the thing with hand drawn animation, uh, especially especially from the animated classics lineup, like um, like from Snow White right through to uh, the films that we uh, the uh, the hand drawn animation films that we had that we had today. Um, a lot of them looked good. They looked amazing when when they were released, and a lot of them still hold up incredibly well today. Especially the Renaissance films, they looked good then, and they still look great today. See, see, I must admit, I'm a bit of a nostalgia guy, and uh, they that makes two of us. Yeah. Okay, great. But I look at older animation and think, like, I grew up with this, so I'm not right now. I'm not entirely used with what's out just now. See, Incredibles one. Like, oh yeah, the first Incredibles film, absolutely, yeah. 
I loved that. Uh, animation was great, Pixar, stuff like that. But mm-hmm. then Incredibles 2, and I'm like, I don't like this animation quite as much. Yeah. I it mean, seemed a bit too real, if that makes sense. It's 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 a, it's a valid criticism. I mean, especially given the fact, especially given the fact that uh, Disney, in essence, already had one big superhero film out earlier in the year with Avengers: Infinity War. Yeah, but uh, but even at that, but even at that, still, it's um, even at that, so I, I still enjoyed The Incredibles too for the uh, for the most part. But um, but overall, overall, as far as Atlantis. Is concerned. This is this is another one of those. This is another one of those cases where it is, uh, for a lot of longtime Disney fans, a very underrated gem from um, uh, from uh, Disney's catalog. And Treasure Planet, which we'll get into in a couple of episodes' time, uh, is another one of those cases where it's a, a very well criminally underrated yes. gem in it's, my eyes. I would say it's the most underrated Disney film. So yeah, far. yeah. But say, That's uh, my opinion. Yeah, say, but say, but but, say, but but even then, even then, these underrated films still have their de- still have dedicated fan bases for them. Uh, I mean, I mean, you've even you've even got films like The Black Cauldron that has that has its own dedicated fan base as well, a cult following, if you will, and that's even despite how poorly it was received by the critics and how hard it bombed at the box office. And yes, uh, believe it or not, Atlantis actually quite was a flop at the bo- box office. Uh, yeah, you say, and and then um, yeah. The point it's I want like to make out is that mm-hmm. a, a lot of the box office flops mm-hmm. in cinema actually turned out to be like have a huge cult following afterwards. Yeah, you see, you you do you do t- you do tend to find that with um you do tend to find that with uh, uh, animated films in particular. Yeah, I mean. Am I right in saying that Hercules was a flop at the box office? No, um, not necessarily. It it was it was successful at the box office, but not as successful as some of Disney's earlier films from the from the Renaissance. Uh, but um, but yeah, that film's that film, especially especially now that this year the film's celebrating its twenty fifth anniversary, it has it has a de- it has a big fan base. You've got people that cosplay as Hercules. You've had people that cover. The songs from the films, uh, from the, the films as well. Really oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and and Hercules is a is a very integral part of the Kingdom Hearts franchise because of the because of the Olympus Colosseum world. Yeah, in Greek mythology, and uh, like I know this isn't a Hercules uh, uh, Kingdom of Isolation, but the character, mm-hmm. the actors who played the characters were good choices as well. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, you had James Woods, Rip Torn, uh, Danny DeVito as well. I, I, I can't imagine anyone else that was filmed. I'm con- I'm convinced every single character that Danny DeVito portrays in voiceover form is modelled after him in some capacity. I'm convinced every character he's voiced is basically modelled to look like Danny DeVito. <laughs> I mean, I've got to admit, Phil does. If you look at him, he does actually quite look like Danny DeVito. Yeah, and the fact that he's small as well does that help? <laughs> yeah, but um, but yeah. Anyway, on to the um, on to the scores for the um, uh, for this film. So overall, overall, as I like, like I say, watch, watching the watching the film today, I definitely thoroughly, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'll so I'll give, but in saying that. I'll give the story a seven, um, because because there, there were a couple of, I say for, for me anyway, there was uh, there was a couple of when we when we pointed them out earlier, uh, there were a couple of glaring plot holes that weren't really explained that clearly, like the like the uh, the crystallized glass. How did he t- how did he get crystal? What um. But, yeah, and how did they create like once Keto went away, how did the crystals work the machines and stuff? Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, so but uh, but despite all that, but despite despite all that, uh they went for an action adventure film and I feel they delivered really well with it. So so and, and this is the thing I've also done as well now, um uh, since since I st- since the um 
since the end of the Renaissance era, where, uh, well, since I started doing the Pixar films, um, I've had my guests as well give their scores, and then mm. and then we get an average out of the two, and then we'll uh, work it out uh, when putting it onto the scoreboard. So, uh, so what would you? So, what would you well, have given? What would you give the story on your end? Well, what I was thinking just now is like, uh, like most Disney films are specially made for kids. Now, this yeah. one, it, I wouldn't say it's that of a kids' film specifically. Okay. So, for. <laughs> Story-wise, in terms of like adulthood, maybe about seven, like you say. But for yeah. kids, you have to give a lower one because it's quite dark and not really wanted for kids. Hmm. Right. Right. And so that might, that might be confusing, but I'll just leave it as a. I'll I'll go with you on the seven basis in terms of the okay. story's plot lines. Yeah. Right. So we'll stick. So we'll stick with the seven for the time being. So there we go. So that uh, so that score stays yeah. as is. Uh, the I was like the the characters. The characters I gave an eight. Because uh, I feel that um, I feel that uh, a couple of the characters that we were introduced to early on in the film, uh, we we didn't get we didn't get much uh, screen time screen time of them. We didn't get to see if uh, did it. We didn't get to see if they. Uh, uh, I say because the, the the team that were that were that Milo was gonna uh, pitch his proposal uh, to. We we only see them like for like a couple of minutes at the start of the film, and we never really see them again. But uh, but but apart from that, but apart from that, the other characters really well written, the chemistry between them fantastic, and um, and of course the uh, the casting as well, uh, all around fantastic. But um, but I say, but I say, it's just it's just the um, it's just the um, it's, it's it's just the characters that we. The characters that we see at the start of the film, we don't really see them again. Uh, that's what that's one of the biggest things that really like drags down the uh, the score for me. So, so I, I I gave it an eight based on that. Uh, me personally, I would give them a seven again, mainly really? because yeah, it's because uh, like you say at the start, we don't really see the uh, the characters. You don't really understand why you know they don't like understand mm -hmm. about Atlantis or want to care, but. And like main characters at the start, they're a bit rushed. You you don't really get see much of them. Okay. Uh, the, the submarine scenes is a bit all over the place. You know, here, there, everywhere, sort of thing. Okay. But it's when they like crash, and that, that's when you get a bit more character basis of things. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and then. You learn about the secondary characters. You learn about their past, and it's all good. And then when you come to Atlantis. You're only really based on two characters that are there, even though there's lots of people around. Yeah. Now, uh, then Nini Mori being the king, yes, great, great speeches in that. Okay. Kida, the voice, decent enough, I must admit, but I, it's hard to understand Kida, I would say, a little bit, story wise. Okay. Like, like, you know, follow me, do this, do that, you know, like, what does this mean? And like, hey, you were. So you were here eight thousand years ago, like not really explained a lot, a whole lot. Mm -hmm. but, like, you would expect them to have a bit more knowledge about their their history. Let's say that. Yeah. So it sounds a bit, it sounds a bit complicated to explain, but uh, I'm but stuck. But, but I say, uh, but I, say I, 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 to I totally get where you're coming from. I totally get where you're coming from regarding that. Um, that there's that they don't really they don't really take the time to. Uh, flesh out some of some of the characters uh, based based on what based on what you've said, but um, but yeah, um, yeah and they speak multiple languages, but then they don't really give a really explanation of why how they do it. Like they say it's a dialect, but was it was it, was it was it was it, was it, it was, yeah I say that that part's mentioned briefly and it's never really brought up again. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, but uh, anyway, um. But I say the visuals now. I was really debating what I was really debating what score to get uh, to give this section um, uh, of the score. So I ended up going. I ended up going for an eight. I mean, because because like I said, it looks a lot of it looks absolutely fantastic. But there was a couple. Of, there was a couple of there was a couple of points here and there where some of it felt 
where some of it felt like it was like uh it 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 wasn't really as polished as yeah. as uh, some some of the like as I mentioned so there was there was a couple of scenes where the animation looked a bit cheap uh, and then and then comparing that to like the action set pieces um but at the end of the day like I said it is st- the, the the animation looks absolutely fantastic regardless despite uh, the criticisms that I've um that I've brought up So uh, I would uh, I would agree with you. I would go for an eight as well. But and you're right about the you know how some some scenes look kind of cheap. Like I understand it's like a new millennium for Disney. They're they're experimenting on like yeah. new CGI and all that. Like like I learned a fact that this is a up until that day, uh, Atlantis came out. It was the most CGI used in the film uh, for a lot of Disney. Uh, so, yeah, yes, I, yes, I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure I've got something. Pretty sure I've got something in there regarding that. Um, yeah. Um, so, so there was definitely something. Some. Uh, I didn't find it. Um, but um, but it's, it's so. I say, it, so anyway, but yeah. so you have scenes where, like, you know, they're focusing on a character, and you have the background, and you mm-hmm. you have like one part of the background look uh, like you know. Flourishy, looking nice, you know, mm-hmm. waterfall, for example. And then you'll have the other one where it's just kind of like a bit blurred out, you know. Yeah. Um, but one thing I've noticed visually, a big thing, mm-hmm. is that how is it, Aubrey, Audrey? Yeah. She looks different facially than anyone else. Yeah, that's a that's a valid point. That's a valid. Like, that's a valid her point. Her eyes yeah. just look different compared to everyone else, and you know, mm-hmm. and she's a bit. Brighter, yeah. I mean, if that makes sense. Yeah, because like, I mean, I mean, I mean, this isn't so much. A, this isn't so much a, a criticism of the character per se, folks. It's no, more. No. It's 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 just a minor nitpick. Uh, she, the way she's drawn in animate, the way she's drawn in particular, um, not necessarily the way she's animated, but the way she's drawn, it's it feels more like that. Um, it feels like she's a character that would fit more into at the time the director video films that Disney were doing. Yes, like like when I was a kid, like believe it or not, Atlantis has a sequel. Yeah, Milo's Return. Yes, and yeah, that was director video because I rubbish it was, and uh, <laughs> and yeah. the, the animation, uh, obviously, no one, because it's director video, they don't really spend time in animation and just kind of go. Here you go. Yeah. And I say the director video films look so much, che- uh, they look so much cheaper yeah. compared to the big mainstream uh, theatrical releases. Don't get me wrong, there's one or two out there that is a bit of a hidden gem, like Neverland, yeah. for example. Return to, Return- oh yeah, Return to Neverland, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people, as far as the, um, was it, uh, I'm, I'm 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 calling the director video films the like because they were done by Disney Toon Studios. So we so I'm just going to go with that when I do get round to doing the director video films eventually. Uh, the Disney Toons films, uh, one in particular, I remember watching a lot when I was younger was Aladdin: and The King of Thieves. That that oh, one's yeah. another that I one's remember. another uh, fan favorite as far as the uh, Disney Toons films are concerned and a lot of that is down to the fact that they managed to convince robin williams to come uh, back to voice the genie yes uh, that that is the uh, out of the three aladdin films uh, oh no sorry out of the two that one's the best uh sequel yeah of the two of them yeah i said i said yes i i think i think everybody's like unanimously unanimously on the same boat mm-hmm. where the first aladdin top of the list then king of thieves then return of jafar yeah, but but, uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, so anyway, uh, regarding the visuals, what, anyway, regarding yeah, the visuals, what, to, yeah, what score would you give the visuals anyway? Yeah, it would be a neat, but uh, like I've mentioned, uh, Aubrey just doesn't seem to fit in terms of everyone else visually wise. Yeah, so that's yeah. And, and that's and I and I and I think, like I say, that's one of the biggest things that um, that's one of the biggest things that I mentioned, like I say, regarding how cheap some of the animation looks that. I mean, because I mean, when you've got the scenes where you've got like uh, Mike, uh, Milo, and uh, Doctor Sweet, for instance, yeah, they're fine. But when you add Audrey to the mix, 
it does sort of like distract you. Like, wait, hang on, why does her why does her character look cheaper than the others? Yeah. One one scene I noticed uh, in in Atlantis uh, the city, the yeah. Aubrey and Cookie were looking at the Atlantean tattoos, and then mm. Cookie goes up and says, "Watch me show is a Minnesota a dance." And then and then you look at Aubrey and like she, it doesn't look right. It just yeah. It just puts you out of focus in a way. Yeah. Is it? Is it? But I say, but I say, but I say, but at the end of the day, like, so like we've said, Audrey is a fantastic character. It's just, it's just how cheap the character design looks, um, yes. which which knocks which knocks it knocks it down on the visual front. So yeah, so yeah, we've both given it an eight. Um, soundtrack can't really fault it. I had to give it a ten. I mean, what what else can I say that I haven't already said about how amazing the soundtrack is? Yeah, so yeah, I do I do I totally agree with you on the ten. It, like in terms of like parts of the scenes where they're like, maybe like yeah. walking and they see Atlantis and then all of a sudden the score kicks in and you're like, oh, that just I just fits it really well. Oh yeah, and, and I do. In terms of score, I do believe that this is the first Disney film of that generation where it didn't have a singing part to it. Uh, for for th- for this era, they because they also they also had uh, they also had Dinosaur the previously previous previous year, which was just. Um, which was just the score again by James Newton Howard, but oh. um, I say it. I say it wasn't a musical. It wasn't yes. a musical, but um, I say, but they did have. Um, but like I said, they did have a song over the end credits, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and so, like I say, for me, I I personally enjoyed it, but um, but I f- but um, I, I have had occasions previously where I've given like uh, some of these areas elevens because of especially during the renaissance era that's how good that era was in particular because there was yeah. just like nothing i could fault with those sections but if I... here but here the song like i said the song was okay i mean if 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 they cut the song out altogether i wouldn't i wouldn't have missed it that much yes but it doesn't this the music doesn't really blow out in your ear it just, it's just kind of like you know feels like it's saying in the background you know yeah but it, it kicks in well with the visuals of what they're looking at and stuff like that oh absolutely yeah yeah because because yeah. like, 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 uh, how would he knew that so he knew when to he knew he knew the timing of when to make uh, the big moments big. He knew when to make those moments big with his music. And I say, but, but I say, look, overall, can't I can't really fault the film score. So but I say this out. I say so we've both given it a 10. But now this is the interesting part. It's the legacy portion of the scores. Now, this is where things get interesting with the uh with the um uh with the legacy portion of the scores because there's quite a fair bit to unpack from this. Now, um, one of the big reasons why it had a difficult box office run, it had a budget of $100 million, and it ended up getting a worldwide total of $186 million worldwide, with $84 million of that coming from the box office, uh, coming from uh, uh, North America. And responding to the disappointing box office performance, Thomas Schumacher, who was the president of uh, Walt Disney Feature Animation at the time, said it seemed like a good idea at the time to not do a fairy tale, uh, a sweet fairy tale, but we but we missed. So that, that was a direct quote from him. And one of the contributing factors to a difficult box office run for the film was the competition it was up against at the time. And that being Shrek and the first Lara Croft Tomb Raider film starring Angelina Jolie. So uh, regarding the market's shift from traditional animation to and, and competition with CGI films, Kirk Wise, one of the film's directors, said, any traditional animator, including myself, can't help but feel a twinge. I think it always comes down to story and character, and one form won't replace the other. Just like, just like photography didn't replace, replace painting, but maybe I'm blind to it. And then... Jeff Jensen of Entertainment Weekly noted that CG, the CGI films, such as Shrek, were more likely to attract the teenage demographic, typically not interested in animation, and called Atlantis 
a marketing and creative gamble. And it sounds like on this occasion, it didn't quite pay off. And the critics, fairly mixed on this one. Four, only 49% on Rotten Tomatoes. So that's a that's a fairly low score. Um, 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 no, and Rotten Tomatoes are the kind of people that always rate it kind of high. So the movie's kind of high. Uh, yeah. But so. um, but yeah, the, the site's consensus is Atlantis provides a fast-paced spectacle, but stints on such things as character development and coherent plot both points we've covered uh, earlier on in the scores. Um, Metacritic, 52. Um, but a cinema score, though, uh, and at the average... Uh, cinema score polls conducted during the opening weekend revealed the average grade cinema goers gave Atlantis was an A on the A plus to F scale. So cinema it sounds like cinema goers enjoyed it more than the critics did. Um, yeah. Here, here's my my personal criticism with critics, is that I, they're adults. I'm assuming. Yeah. But Disney is meant for kids, so they're not going to get the same aspect as a kid feel watching it for the first time than uh, an adult. While at the same time, though the um, the uh, the Disney crew who make the films, they'll have kids as their primary. Um, um, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say kids being their target audience they'll have kids at uh, test screenings of uh, these films and they'll get the feedback from the kids to see if any changes need to be made ah I never would have even thought of that so well that's, um, that's, that's one of the that's one of the big things that was brought up in the Frozen 2 documentary and how that film was um, being put together in the final in the final stages of um, the production of the film before the film got released um but uh, I, I will touch a lot on the uh, Frozen 2 documentary when I do eventually get round to getting uh, to uh, yeah. to Frozen 2. I'm but, not a big fan of Frozen in general, so I do apologise to viewers, viewers, but it's not my thing. Uh, each their own at the end of the day. Um, but see, there, there was there was some... Uh, there's people that have said that... Um, uh, Atlant they saw Atlantis as an interesting look at uh, utopian philosophy uh, of the sort found in classic works of science fiction, such as uh, by H.G. Wells and uh, Jules Verne. And one of the influences as well was, of course, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea being one of the big influences. Yeah. There was some controversy regarding a film called Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water, uh, some viewers noticed that there were some similarities between the two films, particularly in the character design setting and story. And these similarities were noted most prominently by Japan, by viewers in Japan and America. And they were strong enough for its production company, um, Gainax, to be called to sue for plagiarism. Which, uh, yeah, that definitely wouldn't have gone down well. Uh, we actually try uh Hiroyuki Yamaga. Hiroyuki Yamaga was quoted in a 2000 interview saying that we actually tried to get NHK to pick fight pick a fight with Disney, but even the National Television Network of Japan didn't dare to mess with Disney and their lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> We actually did say that we wouldn't actually take them to court. We would be so terrified about them, about what they would do to them in return, that we wouldn't dare. And it's not the first time that has actually happened, because there was a lot of people that brought up some similarities between The Lion King and a Japanese anime, Kimba the White Lion. Yes, uh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. That's like, did that's like, we, did Disney is no stranger to uh, similarity controversies. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, so, but interestingly, yeah. interestingly, while we're on the subject of uh, Japan, folks, uh, some critics even saw some parallels between this film and the 1986 Studio Ghibli film, uh, Laputa Castle in the Sky, directed by Hayao Miyazaki, which also featured magic crystals and Atlantis uh, and... The interesting thing here is that the, the directors of Atlantis 
acknowledged Miyazaki's work as a major influence on their own work in this film. So now, given the fact that Sir Castle in the Sky was the first major release by Studio Ghibli, you can definitely see that this that film um, was a major influence for a lot of people in future projects, such as the design of the um, uh, the robot in Castle in the Sky, uh, having some similarities to Baymax in Big Hero Six. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I honestly love Baymax. Um, yeah. In terms of awards, uh, it was nominated for a number uh, of films, in particular with the Annie Awards, which are basically the Oscars for animated, for, uh, for anything involving animation. Um, nominated for directing, storyboarding, uh, voice acting, and uh, the music, but uh, it didn't actually win anything. Uh, in the Annies that year. It did win a Golden Reel Award in 2002 for Best Sound Editing in an Animated Feature Film. Uh, but that's the that's the only award that it won uh, during award season. Um, Atlantis would also be featured um, prominently in the Stargate uh, TV series, Stargate Atlantis, in this case. Oh. Oh. Um, there's been... There's been a number of um, there's been a couple of video games that were brought out uh, at around about the same time the uh, the film came out. There were one you had uh, two on the, the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance, and you had a one on the PlayStation uh, as well. And that uh, Search for the Journal being one of them, developed by Zombie Studios, and that was released in May of two thousand and one. So this was just a few weeks before the film came out. Yes, um, uh, and, that, and that game, sorry, yeah, and uh, I, and that game, Search for the Journal, was designed for, was created for the Microsoft Windows platform, so that was the PC, and it was a first-person shooter, the first of two games based on the film, and the other one being Trial by Fire, which is um, which was the second game, and that was also released on the Windows platforms just a couple of weeks later on May eighteenth. But in terms of the PlayStation, it was just called Atlantis The Lost Empire, and that was released on the June 14th. And based on, and that was just a day before uh, the film got its wide release in, uh, in the US on June 15th. It did it had its premiere on uh, it had its premiere on uh, June the 3rd at Disney's El Capitan Theater in uh, Hollywood, California. Now, in terms of now in terms of what's happening as far as a live action adaptation of this film is concerned because Disney seemed to have a thing of uh, wanting to do live action remakes of all their films. <laughs> then the next uh, the next one of those is going to be on Disney Plus in just over a month's time at time of recording. We're recording this on August the 4th. Um, it's going to be that there is reports that there is a possible live action adaptation of this film on the way. In July 2019, a report stated Walt Disney Pictures was developing a live action adaptation of Atlantis. And in May the following year, another report claimed that it had entered early development. Now, how long it's going to take for this adaptation to be made remains to be seen. But uh, there's no doubt, uh, as I can guarantee you folks, if there ends up being a live action adaptation of this film, then yeah, I'm definitely going to, I'm definitely going to go and see it. A few, a few criticisms I have hearing about you, what you just told me, is that like majority to this day, there's not there's not been a really really good to me well to me uh, live action remake of okay. a film. Like Mudan, and also uh, sorry, I'll, I'll start by saying this: mm -hmm. they tend to change the story quite a bit in live actions. Like, and you can like, you can un in some aspects you can understand why they would do that because uh, they don't want because unless you're the Lion King remake. Yes, the last the last thing you wanted to be 
is for, to be basically a shot-for-shot shot remake. Yes, but it, uh, like Lion King is my favorite animated film of the Dis- of Disney in general. Yes. Now, I went to see the live action one in the cinema. Mm-hmm. I was I was the first one as well because I was I was keen. Opening now, day, yeah, yep. And uh, I must admit, there was a lot of the, like I like I like a bit of it, but there's a lot I didn't like. Like for example, mm-hmm. uh, I can't remember what the area that Timon and Pumbaa live in uh, is called, but. In the original, it was just Lem and Simba. In this one, there's a lot more animals there. The reason being? No idea. Yeah. And uh, Ed, the hyena, he wasn't that crazy nutcase in this one compared to mm. the original. Yeah. My my mum my mum's favourite quote that she said to me, like I was a guinea pig to, uh, to see Lion King remake so uh, she would like to see it. And she asked him, does Ed bite his leg off? Or I wanted to try and chew his leg off, and I go no, <laughs> and, I, and I go no, and she says, "Right, I'm not, I'm not watching it." <laughs> so that definitely sounds like Ed's her favorite character, then. Yes, but in terms of live action, yes, uh, I wasn't. To this day, I haven't seen Mulan because I heard about the story changes, and I'm not keen mm-hmm. because there's no Mushu and there's no my favorite Disney song of all time, "Make a Man Out of You." Oh, everybody loves that song, absolutely, yeah. But yeah, but again. But again, this is one of those cases where I feel that the um, because I mean, that's because I have seen uh, the remake, but um, I feel that they focused too much on the action set pieces rather than developing the story and the character for this yeah. re- uh, for that remake. But um, I, but that's that's just, the line, right? yeah, yeah, that's the like, yeah, so that, yeah, that's just me at the end of the day, whereas. With something like Beauty and the Beast, you actually got some backstory to to more of the characters, um, and it, and that actually helps them feel more fleshed out uh, in comparison to the original. I mean, nothing against the original folks, but um, it's one of those rare cases where, uh, as I say, this is my opinion anyway, that the remake is on par in some aspects to the original, and Beast Song Evermore. Is one of my favorite songs from um because they they often try and get uh, a song, they try and write a song specifically for the remake uh, of, a, of a particular film. Is that Evermore is one of my favorites? Speechless as well from the Aladdin remake, uh, as well, is another one of my favorites because uh, I even said it when I um, when I reviewed the film uh, after it came out that that song had Greatest Showman vibes written all over it because they actually got um, the guy, uh, they actually got the team that helped put the Greatest Showman soundtrack together. Uh, the guys that wrote the songs for the Greatest Showman uh, on board to help with uh, Aladdin uh, in this case. Um, one, th- one thing I want to point out is that if for, like, we're talking about that this is a, in a, Apparently, Atlantis is a planned uh, live action remake. Now, yep. the original, as we've mentioned before, it's quite mm-hmm. quite dark for kids. Uh, well, quite dark in general. Now, will, the, will this live action remake will be equally dark? Or will yeah, it be- how dark are they going to go? That's a valid point. Yeah. Um, but um, I, suppose, I, suppose we'll, I suppose we'll find out when or if they do go ahead with this. Uh, for. for if they want to make Atlantis dark, I know the exact director, Sammy Rami. He will, he will do, he will make it dark enough. Last, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. As good as that would be, the last thing we need is another Doctor Strange multiverse of madness situation. Too dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, I mean, look for crying out loud. Did you see how brutal the Illuminati death was? Illuminati. Uh, Black Black Bolt. Head explodes. Oh yes, that one. Yeah, and and uh, yes, that was uh, that was quite dark. Yes, I did admit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he again, st- he stretched. He stretched that twelve rating as far as he could. So only twelve. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would have. I would have thought. I would have thought it would have gone to a fifteen. But then, yeah, 15 but then, in saying that, in saying that though, twelve a, a twelve rating. To guarantee to guarantee being able to okay. get um 
as much from the box office as possible. So from a business yeah. standpoint, the 12 makes sense. But anyway, uh, let's say a couple of things um, in terms of their Disneyland attractions. Atlantis was going to have uh, a Disneyland uh, attraction, uh, but that ended up uh, not coming to fruition because of uh, poor reception. Um, there was going to be a TV series uh, called Team Atlantis that ended up being cancelled. And the ep- the finished episodes for what for the uh, cancelled TV series ended up just being put together for the director video sequel Miles Return. Ah. Uh, so, oh, no, 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 that makes sense. There we go. So that film ended up just being a compilation of finished episodes for a show that never came to be. I mean, me and my sister watched it, my younger sister, and it, mm-hmm. like, we didn't find it, at the time, we didn't find it that terrible because, of course, we were kids and we didn't know much. But looking back at it, it definitely has been, it definitely has dated quite bad. Yeah, you, you do tend to find that with a lot of the uh, uh, director video films that uh, uh, Disney have made. But there, there is the odd occasion where they do have, I mean, I will say, especially the Winnie the Pooh films that were released director video. Like uh, Tigger movie and Piglet's big movie, yeah. Those those films they look they looked great when they came out and they still look great today. Yeah, because like, then because like, because uh, Piglet's big movie is is another one of those uh, director video films that actually got a theatrical release here in the UK. Um, that I really enjoyed a lot when I was younger. Yeah, I do remember watching. I was never a huge Winnie the Pooh fan, but I remember watching Piglet's big movie, and that was quite. Intriguing to a good yeah. watch. Yeah. But I say, at the end of the day, it, it's that's a testament to the longevity and the legacy that the Winnie the Pooh franchise has. Because when uh, when I when I went through the um, many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, and this was like last year, uh, I ended up giving the legacy an eleven just because of how big the franchise is now with all the, the TV series that have come out of it, uh, the films that have come out as well. And, and of course, Winnie the Pooh also being part of the, uh, the Kingdom Hearts franchise with the hundred acre wood world, which is um, just, it's like effectively mini games, but even, but even then, but even then you've still got the, um, the Winnie the Pooh theme in the background when you're going through the, um, uh, Hundred Acre Wood World. So, but yeah. Um, so taking everything into account, that um, I couldn't really give the legacy anything higher than a seven. Yeah, a seven sounds all right. Now, now is like, I'm going to be stupid saying this, but legacy that one, that one in terms of like how well do you know it from the past? Like how's it? How the reception has it been over the years, correct? Uh, now, yeah, so, so, and, 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 and of course, and of course, uh, um, and of course, the um, and, and of course, like uh, the, the following that it has now. So, I must admit, I'm going to score slightly lower and give it a six, only because uh, okay, to the, the, if you weren't around that time to watch it, you won't have a clue about it. Because no one would, uh, no one would, be, would really know about it if they were that. Say, like you were maybe ten years old in that area today, you mm-hmm. you wouldn't really know much about Atlantis back in the day. Okay, but you know about the Lion King, Aladdin, Tarzan, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, we all know about the we all know about those ones. Yeah, uh, Atlantis just is that one that's kind of like in the bottom there that no that a lot of people really miss is what I'm saying. Yeah, and and don't know about so. But uh, but even but even at that, but even at that, still, um, as we mentioned earlier, it it has grown a dedicated fan base for uh, for the film. But um, but yeah, so so that ended up uh, bumping the legacy be- between the two of us down to a uh, six point five. The characters earlier got a seven point five. So that now gives it a score of 78%. So taking that into account and seeing where it lands on the scoreboard, it's 
it's not a bad score, but at the same time, it's not great either. It's it's ahead of films like The Rescuers. Um, it's ahead of The Rescuers and Dinosaurs. So, uh, not including not including the uh, the package films from uh, the World War Two era, which include like some Final Fantasy three, three, three Caballeros, things like that. It's actually the third lowest. Um, it, it's it's the third lowest non-package film in the Kingdom of Isolation so far, which that's a, like, that's a, and, and that's just, and that's despite the high score that it's got. But um, but even then, it's it's a relatively low score based on the films that we've talked about so far. Here's an interesting point. In my opinion, the reason it's it's we said earlier, it's an experimental film. They were, yeah. they were trying new things. They weren't exactly pros at, it at that point. So the reason, the reason they weren't pros, so that's why it's got a low score. But it's still a decent watch. It's not like it's a total flop where they were experimenting and they just failed completely. Yeah, they, they were getting a good bash. Now some things are not right, but some things are right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and 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 that's and that's and that's what this film is based on the score. It has its good points. It has its bad points, but. At the end of the day, I, I would, I would still, I would still recommend you guys give this film a watch um, uh, now, as well. I, another fact that I pulled up today, yeah, is that if you were to give a show to your young kids, I, was, I would suggest being in the room with them because a fact I've learned it's got the highest body count on that Disney film to this day. <laughs> and we can thank Matt Pat from Game Theory regarding that one. Yep. Because he actually did a thing a couple of years ago where he actually went through every single animated Disney film to see which film had the highest body count. Yes. And Atlantis has won it. So it's, it's the highest, it's the top in one retrospect, but <laughs> like you don't see gory deaths or anything like that. It is quite a still dark film. So like I say, watch it with your kids. <laughs> Yeah, especially for, especially for their first viewing, folks. So uh, yeah. that's uh, so that's uh, that's our word of advice for you guys. But anyway, that is it. But anyway, that does it for this episode of the uh, King of Isolation. So Jamie, thanks for uh, jumping on board for this um, for this episode. It's been a pleasure covering this. Uh, oh, uh, this like say, thank you. Thanks for having me, and I appreciate being here. Yeah. And uh, like I say, you can call me back when you need Treasure Planet time. Because oh, uh, abs we, absolutely, we thank you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, I say well, I'm definitely going to be looking forward to covering uh, Treasure Planet uh, in the near future. But the next, so if, if you guys enjoyed this episode of the Kingdom of Isolation, you can uh, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be part of the Kingdom of Isolation yourself, you can hit the subscribe button uh, down the bottom. Click the bell, turn on notifications so you don't miss when an episode goes live. The next episode, we are going to be heading to Hawaii for Lilo and Stitch. But until then, folks, we'll see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation.